Welcome. Uh, I think many of you are familiar with the programs that Professor Alexander runs. I sometimes start them and I occasionally end them. Today you have a much greater treat. General Gray will end this program and I'll just say a few words and then turn it over to Yona. Um, and I think in many ways the title of the program is self-explanatory. Uh, one thing I've learned listening to Professor Alexander, terrorism is a very troubling phenomenon, but it's not everything. I mean, the world we look at is large, has many possibilities, many problems. I would say the overall problems, that we could call them strategic, or problems of foreign policy. Uh, and within that set of problems, we have terrorism. And if you're familiar with Jonah's work, you'll know he's produced literally scores of books, I think over 100, dealing with how you cope with, how you look at terrorism, how you cope with it. And uh, of course, there are many means, uh, including overall strategic, strategic considerations, certainly the use of force, although my own feeling, notwithstanding that General Gray is here, is that force is very limited. Ultimately, it's a to be a surgical tool. And then we have diplomacy, which of course is another bit of surgery. And I think this is the subject of this program. And I'm going to turn this over to Yona and remind him that when he speaks, you have to speak into this microphone. The light is green. And then I'll hold this. And if you decide to speak from where you're sitting, I'll pass it along. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Don, for your uh, introduction. Uh, as uh, always, uh, we're very grateful for your support of um, our academic work for a number of decades already. And uh, clearly, together, we try to be better. Um, at any rate, um, number one, let me welcome uh, everyone here, and um, as uh, many of you know, you do have also the program, but you know that in order to advance uh, knowledge, we have to develop uh, cooperation, national and international cooperation academically, and of course, on governmental level, which will come back to it, and that's the mission of uh, this event. Um, in addition, of course, to the International Institute, we would like to express um, <clears throat> our appreciation for many, many years with the Potomac Institute for uh, Policy Studies. Uh, <coughs> we are honored to have today uh, General Al Gray, who is the Chairman of the Board of Regents, uh, and um, provides extraordinary leadership to our work with, with us, and uh, he will participate in our discussion later on. Also, I, I have an obligation to mention uh, our colleagues from the University of Virginia Law School for their continuing support. So uh, let me move immediately, I think, to our program in the interest of time. So you know, of course, Professor Don Wallace, and uh, I would like to introduce first uh, Ambassador uh, Retired Charlie Ray, right here. Um, he's a former U.S. Ambassador to Cambodia and Zimbabwe, and De Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for POW, the Missing Personnel Affairs. And um, the purpose of this discussion, and we're going to begin with um, Ambassador Ray, is to celebrate the publication of very important, uh, I think, uh, books. Um, one of them now, I will mention the ethical dilemmas and the practice of diplomacy that um, will provide, I think, insights into what works and doesn't work and um, we would like him to, to begin in a minute. Um, 
we distribute it also the bio, so I'm not going to go into details. At any rate, um, none of the speakers here need any introduction in Washington and internationally. So um, he will be the first, uh, the second according to uh, our program right here is Ambassador Retired again, Ron uh, Newman, who is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and U.S. Ambassador to Algeria, Bahrain, Afghanistan, and currently is the President of the American Academy of Diplomacy. And fortunately for us, uh, academics, we always try to um, contact those individuals, institutions that can provide guidance to our studies um, in order to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So we're very grateful to Ambassador Newman for his leadership at uh, the American Academy of Diplomacy. And again, uh, he has a book, a new book by the name of Three Embassies, Four Wars, a personal memoir, and we distributed uh, the flyers, and um, he will explain what he tried to communicate right here. And um, uh, last but not least, as I mentioned already, General Al Gray, um, the retired, as you know, uh, from the Marine Corps as the 29th Commandant of the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps. As I mentioned, is the Chairman of the Board of Regents the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, and also Senior Fellow. I would like again to celebrate his new book right here. We distributed the flyers um, on his experiences that provides a inside view of what it means to be a leader uh, in the military sense, diplomacy, and the two go together. And it is a follow-up to the first book right here, the early years from 1950 to 1967. So uh, it will provide some uh, personal uh, insights as, as well. So I would like really to, to move on uh, with the, the discussions. You will have the information we try to provide you with the information. One last uh, footnote. We are delighted uh, to have here, obviously, representative from governments, uh, embassies. We always cooperate, cooperate uh, with them um, in terms of how to deal not only with uh, to combat terrorism, but to find some uh, conflict resolutions to many challenges uh, around the world, and uh, particularly now with uh, confusion, debate on the role of diplomacy, whether we're shifting from traditional diplomacy to some other kind of diplomacy, some call it subnational, some call it ecumenical, some call it disruptive, whatever it is, but we do have the specialists who are going to deal with it. And I'm really delighted that uh, we have an increasing number of young people, students, and I, I would like to recognize particularly um, the group that uh, we are responsible for in terms of summer internship uh, program. Uh, we have 10 students from different universities. Could you stand up at least or raise your hand? No speeches? Okay, wonderful, it's part of the group. Uh, at any rate, uh, we're delighted because after all, we are talking about the next generation and uh, the bad news is that uh, they would have to deal with many of uh, the challenges with, we see now, but unfortunately there are going to be some more complicated challenges in the future. But the good news is that they're uh, dedicated and are interested in the study of terrorism. And uh, another footnote before I invite the speakers. I, I think uh, any time we speak about the challenges, the security challenges at home and abroad, whether it is terrorism or uh, 
long wars or short wars, we have to recognize the service of the military um, personnel and their activities, as well as the diplomats. And as I remember, J.F. Kennedy uh, indicated a long time ago that diplomacy or defense cannot be separated and employed alone. They have to work together. So uh, again, uh, with this uh, very brief um, uh, introduction, I would like to invite the distinguished ambassador right here to um, begin with uh, our dialogue and discussion. And uh, I'm sure that uh, it will also mention something about your very important uh, volume. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, with all of the other crises we have popping up these days, like crabgrass on your lawn, it's easy to forget that international terrorism and violent extremism is still a significant security threat. Uh, indeed, for many people in many places, an existential threat. And while we're preoccupied with rogue nuclear programs, threat of a global trade war, and a decidedly unsettled global climate, all of which are, in fact, existential threats, extremist groups continue to pursue their radical agendas on multiple fronts. And even if our defense and security forces weren't preoccupied with these other priorities, or even if these crises should suddenly disappear, these forces are ill-equipped to deal with a complex threat like this alone. Now, before those of you who are part of the defense establishment rise up in righteous indignation, let me hasten to add, this is not a negative assessment of our defense forces. I believe that we have the most capable military in the history of the world. And as a veteran of 20 years Army service and a student of history, I think I know what I'm talking about. There is no military force on the planet that's a match for us when it comes to doing the things that we were organized and trained to do. But let's be real. The threats posed by extremist groups don't fall into neat categories that lend themselves to kinetic solutions. You don't use a sledgehammer to hang wallpaper. So having stipulated that the threat is complex and multifaceted, what's the appropriate solution? The answer is deceptively simple. The solution, eh, a little less so. First, borrowing from the military's phrase book, we need to analyze the situation. Uh, the approach I recommend is one that I use with plotting and writing my mystery novels. I call it chunking. Uh, and those of you from the South probably think chunking is, a, is an act of tossing something, but I use it differently. As I apply it, it's, it's a process of breaking a complex situation, or in the case of writing a mystery novel plot, into its component parts, determining what tools or methods are most appropriate for each part, and then using those tools or methods in coordination with each other to solve the problem chunk by chunk. The tool that I want to talk about today is the soft power tool of diplomacy. For a lot of people, when you say diplomacy, what comes to mind is an image of people spending a lot of time at cocktail receptions or sitting around talking, thinking, and analyzing, but actually doing little. And you might ask, how does that contribute to solving the problem of terrorism? Well, I rec recall a phrase from my days as a young Army lieutenant, know your enemy. Back then, it was mostly confined to tactical order of battle, number of guns, number of tanks, number of men, capability of that combination to afflict, inflict damage on our forces. But when you're dealing with shadowy extremist groups, our forces need to know a whole lot more. I mean, they still need to know the numbers, because on occasion, you're going to have to shoot someone. 
but killing one terrorist or destroying or neutralizing a cell or even a larger terrorist formation is a short-term fix that fails to address the larger problem. Terrorism is much more than the terrorists who commit heinous acts. We need to develop methods and courses of action to address the issues underlying the motivations for extremists, and getting the information we need to do that effectively is frankly outside the confidence of our military forces. Here are just a few of the issues that need to be addressed. What are the factors that motivate individual terrorists and organizations? How are these organizations funded and supported? How, where, and who do they recruit? And what's their ultimate objective? You know, diplomats are often immersed in the very societies from which these terrorist groups originate, and they're actually best positioned to get the answers to these and other questions. Therefore, they should also be part of the discussions about the courses of action we pursue to address the problem. No matter, no nation, no matter how powerful, can deal with the complex challenge of terrorism alone. We need allies willing to cooperate with us on all fronts to address not just the acts of terrorism, but the underlying causes if we're to effectively neutralize or destroy these organizations. Diplomats are skilled in international negotiations, and they're the best tool for developing these alliances. Even in those cases when it's been determined that a direct military response to a terrorist group is the best course of action, there's still a role for diplomacy. When we deploy military forces against a terrorist organization, in addition to the usual order of battle, we need to equip them with more if they are to prevail. These forces need to understand the cultural and political environment in which the terrorist operates, the extent of local support for or opposition to the terrorists, and what non-military problems they're likely to encounter as they carry out their military mission. And I witnessed an example of this during my time as a consultant to the U.S. Army, helping to prepare units for deployment to areas where they faced situations short of direct warfare. And one of the exercises, the training objective was to secure a U.S. diplomatic facility prior to evacuation of American citizens from the area. There were a group of soldiers at the entrance to the facility holding back a crowd of locals who were clamoring to be included in the evacuation, which is, which is pretty true to life. If, if when the Americans go, all the locals want to go with them. Uh, while these soldiers were busy keeping the gates to the facility clear, a group of local militia marched up, grabbed someone from the crowd, made him kneel, and put a gun to his head. This wasn't part of the scenario. The poor young sergeant in charge of the troops at the gate, the initial, the first time we did the exercise, he just stood there like a deer in headlights. No one would tell him what to do. It was left to this young sergeant as it is quite often is with our young military people when they're in the field, to make the decision, what do I do now? It wasn't in his rules of engagement. It wasn't in his standing orders. And it certainly wasn't in the rehearsal for the exercise. It was, it was meant to test his ability to think on his feet. Uh, three iterations, it took three iterations of this exercise before we got a response that was, was acceptable. And one, uh, they simply stood there and allowed the militia to execute the person they'd taken out. That's clearly, there's, they didn't do anything illegal by not doing anything, but that wasn't a very good solution. Uh, the second exercise, second time we did it, the young sergeant said enough's enough, and so he told his men to lock and load, and they started firing at the Milton Militia, of course, the, the referees to the exercise said they also killed half the crowd, the innocent civilians who were standing there. That's clearly not an effective solution. <laughs> we finally had a young E6 who reminded me a lot of myself when I was a young NCO before I was commissioned, who had four of his men 
watched the gate. He took the rest. I marched out to the militia and had each of his men walk up to a militia guy and put his AR-15 to his head. So you shoot him, we shoot you. Perfect solution. The militia decided maybe today they won't kill anyone, and so they marched away. What this, what this was for was to teach these young soldiers that not every situation you encounter is going to be one that was in the training manual. Not every situation you have to make a decision about is going to be a choice between legal or illegal. Sometimes it's going to be a choice between both are legal, but one just feels more right than the other. These are the type of things that when our forces go out to operate against terrorists that they need to be prepared for. I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. The problems we face when dealing with terrorist organizations are complex and they're multidimensional. They require complex interagency solutions. Each situation faced is unique, but most of them still have a common thread, and that common thread is often not military. You know, a master carpenter's tool kit never has only one tool, but it has a variety of tools which can be applied to whatever situation that arises. And we need to make sure that our tool kit for dealing with terrorism has all of the tools needed and be prepared to use them as appropriate. In our efforts to counter violent extremism and terrorism, unfortunately, dem diplomacy is seldom, if ever, thought of as a key tool. But in this complex undertaking, it can and often should play a major role. But just as with our military forces, if our diplomats are to be successful, they must be adequately prepared. There are a number of areas, I believe, where more intensive training and education is needed, but I'd like to focus on one that I care very deeply about, and that's ethical decision making. And you might gather from my illustration of this story of the Army exercise, uh, that's something that I've been involved in a lot over the last several years. In any conflict, the people involved have to make decisions and take actions to get the job done. But they're still, that are still, those actions are in line with our national values. And I'm not talking about a choice between what's legal and illegal, or not necessarily even between what's right and what's wrong. I mean, we have to hope that our officials and our military people already know how to make this type of decision. What I'm concerned about are those situations that fall into the gray areas those times when there's no clear distinction between the choices, when it's based on individual or institutional values, and those values are in conflict. It's what I call an ethical dilemma. And diplomats, indeed all government officials, in and out of uniform, encounter situations that fall into these gray areas of moral and ethical uncertainty and ambiguity all the time. During my 30 plus years as a diplomat, I faced ethical dilemmas on more occasions than I could count. And I'd like to think that I handled most of them well, but I'm pretty certain that in some I fell short of perfection. My own experiences and my observations of the struggles of many of my colleagues led me to the realization that more needs to be done to prepare people for situations of moral and ethical ambiguity. When I retired from government service in 2012, I began to do serious research on this issue. Uh, and the preliminary result of that is the book that Dr. Alexander mentioned, Ethical Dilemmas and the Practice of Diplomacy. It's a very short book. And it's designed to stimulate what I believe is a much needed conversation about ethical decision-making in government. It is not, nor was it ever intended to be an in-depth treatment of the subject. You could say it's a snack or an appetizer designed to whet the appetite for a more fulsome consideration of what I believe is a critically important topic 
how do we prepare government officials to function with integrity in situations of legal, moral, ethical, and political ambiguity? While the situations I describe in the book apply to the day-to-day -day work of officials, they're perhaps even more applicable when we're dealing with extremist or terrorist groups. These organizations don't abide by the Geneva Convention on Warfare or any other civilized code of conduct. They integrate themselves into civilian populations, sometimes even using them as human shields, and they attack non-combatant targets indiscriminately. Operations against such groups require friendly forces to be especially vigilant because it exposes them to charges of use of excessive force or inflicting unacceptable numbers of non-combatant casualties. When out of frustration or for expediency, we come close to or cross ethical boundaries, such as the use of enhanced interrogation techniques, we only aid these groups in their recruitment and propaganda efforts and we leave ourselves again open to charges of hypocrisy. If there was ever a time when a focused national debate on how to conduct anti-terrorist operations was needed, while at the same time staying true to our core values, that time is now. It's my desire, no, I'd say it's my belief that this book is the opening gambit in that conversation and I would hope it starts here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure that my book really connects with today's subject very well. So I won't, except for a lifetime of experience, I suppose that connects. But, um, it was an autobiography. And, thanks. And uh, I, I put it together as a little, it, it talks a lot about what diplomacy is. And it's called Three Embassies, Four Wars, which is uh, Vietnam, Algeria, where I was ambassador during very bloody years in the 90s. Uh, Iraq, where I spent 16 months uh, before becoming ambassador in uh, Afghanistan, and that was the fourth war. Uh, so there's a certain amount of experience of terrorism covered in that book, uh, but that's all I'm really going to say about the book. Terrorism, I think, two points. Terrorism is a tactic. It's not a goal of the perpetrators. It usually has an Unless it's pure anarchism, I, somebody goes on a shooting episode, we usually don't even define that as terrorism, although if you happen to be in the middle of one, it's pretty terrifying. But terrorism, as we talk about it in political terms, is usually a goal for a political purpose. And frankly, outsiders, and we tend to be outsiders to almost every conflict which generates terrorism, outsiders actually have a very poor record of ever being able to resolve those conflicts. They usually have to be resolved by other people. And we have the sad experience that terrorism tends to go on for a very long time. It's been around in the world for quite a while in different, different guises, and I expect that will continue. The other sad part about terrorism is it almost never achieves anything. It kills a lot of people. It almost never produces the final result that terrorists desire, the political result. It produces casualties in large numbers. It very rarely changes the course of events, except for, you know, occasionally lucky shots like the fellow who shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914 kicked off the entire World War. I guess you'd have to say that was a successful terrorist operation. In, in political terms again. Other thing about terrorism is military tactics don't solve terrorism. They're highly necessary in protecting us. They're highly necessary in coping with terrorism. 
They don't solve it. Almost no place do you have, can you, only when you have an insurgency that is put down and loses militarily can you find examples of where military means alone resolve terrorism. Now, Sri Lanka had a lot of terrorism, and it finally had the very bloody and messy conclusion of its Tamil revolt. You could say that is a military solution. But other than that, there are very few military solutions. It's also just worth noting, by the way, that right now, the majority of terrorism we have to worry about is terrorism that comes out of Islamic jihadi movements. But it's good to remember that that has not always been the case. You've had terrorism from anarchists, you've had terrorism from communists uh, in previous periods, you had terrorism from insurgent groups that, uh, whose ends were all political. Uh, it, these were not they were not religious, and they were not, uh, and they were not as Islamic based. So it's good to remember that uh, yeah, I guess. that uh, all terrorism is not coming out of religious differences. Now, when you look at recent experience, one of the things you see is that our experience in the big wars, recent big wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, where we have dealt with terrorism is actually not very good. We've won lots of tactical victories. We're not doing too well, although I still think we have a chance in Afghanistan, subject for another lecture, but we've been at war now again, with terrorism being a part of that war, although not always the driving force, for quite some time. We don't win it militarily. When you look around, and you say, you know, where, where do we have a better record of dealing with combinations of insurgency and terrorism? It's Bosnia, Kosovo, Uganda against the Lord's Resistance Army. And the point there that I'm now getting to the subject of our lecture is simply how tied together diplomacy and counterterrorism are. They're not alternatives. They're, they're separate tools that you use for the same problem. Just as you, you know, might hold something with a wrench and turn it with a screwdriver, uh, you need both pieces. And diplomacy is, in fact, not separable from the military instrument. It's an essential foundation. And that's my main point. Everything else is kind of an example. On the simplest level, diplomacy is an enabler. Military operations require overflight authorities. They require landing. They require refueling. They require fuel for the ships and the planes, transit authorities. All of those things are negotiated, by the way, by diplomats. Uh, without, but without those authorities, the military grinds to a halt. That's just sort of enabling the military. That's the simple level. The more complex level is that diplomacy is an essential part of creating the strategies to deal with terrorism, because the answers are often political. And that's a pretty simple truth, but it, it is one of our weakest points in the United States, is our recurring inability to combine our military and our political tools. We treat them as alternatives. We give separate goals to the military. Civilians, by the way, don't read mission statements that are written by the military, so if they happen to get the political piece of the mission statement wrong, we won't know about it. Um, we don't have mission statements, so they won't know if we understand what we're doing. Um, but when you don't tie these things together, they don't work very well. For example, we have done very well in destroying the, at least the physical part, territorial part of the Islamic State. We are not very close to security in Syria. We seem to be close to pulling out. We had a goal at one point of seeing Assad go. That's completely gone. The people we armed uh, have largely been defeated. And we now got a problem of Russians and Iranians, and we're making a lot of noise about it, but we're not very sure what we're going to do about it. 
but a lot of the tools we could have used for that were during the military period, but we didn't integrate the military operation with political goals. The military operation was given a military goal, destroy ISIS. Nothing wrong with that goal. Trouble was it wasn't nested in any larger political purpose. And so you end up with a very messy situation. In Iraq, we've gone back and forth. Iraq's a long story. But on the one piece of dealing with ISIS, the particular terrorist piece, we could have held back a little bit on some of our application of force in order to push the components of the Iraqi government, Arabs, Kurds, Sunni, Shias, to work out in advance some of the issues. Like, how are you going to govern most? And we spent a lot of time, the whole military operation, driving for the taking of Mosul. Mosul is a divided city. It's half Kurd, half Sunni. Um, it, it, you, you could guarantee that you were going to have problems after you took it back with governing it, because you had the same problems with governing it before you had the battle. Before, our military is was a critical piece. We could have, at that point, used it, maybe. At least the possibility is there to say, look, wait a minute, we're not quite going to go forward with this. You guys have to work out a solution to how you're going to do this afterwards. It's not ours to work out, but we have a lot of leverage to push people to get reasonable when they need our backing for the battle. Once the battle is over, they do not need us. They may soon be asking us to go home. Um, political leverage is not a constant. And it's not just because you have troops on the ground, it's the political situation that surrounds the troops. And we need to bring these things together, and we do this terribly. Um, you know, for instance, quick, quick quiz question. At what point does the chain of command between the civilians and the military cross, come together with a single decision maker? President of the United States. There is no point in our entire structure below the President of the United States where one person is in charge of what we're doing in the field. Now, there are certainly places where it works very well. I had very good relations with General Eikenberg when I was in Afghanistan. General, uh, neighbor, General Casey had good relations with Neighbor Buddy. General Sanchez had horrible relations with Ambassador Bremer in one case. I mean, I've seen it go both ways. But the important point for the discussion is we leave it entirely to personalities. We do not, we have no integrated structure to put our diplomats and our military together in some normal, regular way. And we have a lot of good examples, and we have some horribly bad examples. The other thing you should know, by the way, is I do not know a situation where a cabinet department dictates disciplines its own person when the two in the field don't get along. Cabinet departments almost universally support their own. So the only person who can tell the commanding general and the ambassador to play nice or I'm going to fire you is the President of the United States. He's usually busy. Um, so it just illustrates the need for an integrated structure uh, or some delegation of authority. Actually, I wrote an article once uh, with former uh, uh, former director of national intelligence, Dennis Blair, and former head of special forces, Admiral Eric Olson, where we recommended, among other things, a much stronger role for ambassadors in the field in carrying out operations in certain fragile states. I, I think nobody need worry that this is going to happen, but uh, it was amusing to produce the article with one retired diplomat and two retired four-star flag officers. So there are a lot of people who recognize the needs, but we have not done it. So what am I leaving you with? We have situations with terrorism which are historic. The phenomenon is historic. And we are likely to deal with it for a very long time. The particular piece of the phenomenon we're in of Islamic Jihad is not a function of the Muslim world writ large. I've got lots of Muslim friends. But 
until it burns itself out somehow within interplay within Muslim societies. It's not going away. It's probably not going away in your lifetime. Therefore, we do need tactics and strategies and policies to deal with as many of the pieces of the phenomenon as we can. And that's going to require that we look at the things Ambassador Ray was talking about. We understand cultures. That tends to be more the diplomat's function. Uh, and it also means that as we develop the strategies based on that understanding, that the pieces work together. The military and the civilian piece come together in much more integrated structures in some more formal chains of command um, and with some form of accountability rather to a single rather than a separate source within our bureaucracy. And those are very large needs. They've been there uh, for at least the last 20 years and there longer. But uh, they're still there today. And uh, so when some of you uh, have gotten your degrees and are giving these lectures, they may still be there then, but I hope not. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I'd like to ask, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Ambassador Newman, a question about your point. Is your mic on? It's supposed to be. Is it on? Where is that young man? Maybe. Maybe. It, well, I'm talking into it, and the light is green. Now, there's no battery in it, so it's not going to be on. You should bring this up. That's what I did. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. I'd like to meet the woman or man who designed this. Uh, and introduce him to my bigger brother. Um, Mr. Ambassador, uh, first, just a quote. Uh, James Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis, has always said that the military and the diplomats and the developers have to work together. So it's not, we hear that all the time, so presumably that reflects a broader recognition. Now, to get a bit more operational, the National Security Council meets. Doesn't this issue come up ever between state and the Defense Department, others, don't they talk about this? I, I was in the field with the government. The ambassador is in charge of all of the civilian agencies. He's the boss of all civilian agencies in the field, whether it's the International Internal Revenue Service or anyone else. But, um, so I sort of sense your view, but does this not come up? Oh, it comes up constantly. It's just never resolved. <laughs> um, it, that is, the theory is there. The practical problem is that m most of the hard issues are going to be in what you might call gray areas. They're not going to be where there's a clear cut right or wrong. Now, I talked about, for instance, how you might hold back some military assets for political pressure. But on any specific decision there, you will face the fact that some people will be afraid that you will suffer some serious battlefield reverse for holding back too much. And on the other side, that if you don't hold back anything, you give Iraqi political leaders a free ride to pay attention to their own domestic constituencies so that, for instance, we were very worried about the degree to which Shia militias were being formed and carrying out depredations. We, that is something we might have had a little more influence on if we'd been able or willing to integrate the military and the political peace. But in doing that, you might well have suffered something on the battlefield. Those are the kinds of issues where the actual specific issue is rarely, almost never, going to have a clear single answer. It's going to be a subject of dispute. And people will tend, although not always, to dispute based on their particular piece of the mission. And so that comes back to, yes, they talk about it, but when they have a real issue and they differ, you don't have a single place to make a decision. Let me ask you a another question. Are there any countries that have done this better? The French, the British, the Israelis, the Russians, China? Um, the British did it better in their Indian, in their frontier policy. They, they had, uh, the, well, they were still a colonial power. Most of what they did, by the way, in the frontier policy is not very useful, even though people try to cherry pick lessons out of it. But uh, what they did in the frontier years where they had a political officer, the political officer had his own military force of the frontier constabulary. And as long as he could handle it with his particular force, 
the political agent was in charge, including using his force. When he had to call in the military, then the military was in charge. Mm. Uh, to the great disgust, usually, of the political officer uh, who didn't agree with what was going on in many cases, the military would ignore him. So they didn't always do it well, but at least they had a single approach. One was in charge till the other was in charge. Uh, we recommended uh, in that article I spoke about a, a way not to have a single authority, but to have a great deal more authority within the ambassador's rank. But it's not something that countries do well. Uh, they do it well when they have military dictatorships. Now, we did it fine in Japan. General Marshall was in charge of, <laughs> you know, General MacArthur was in charge of everything. Um, but by and large, you know, militaries are very resistant to having damn civilians tell them what to do. Uh, and the civilians don't always know what to do, and, and, or they may know how. It goes back to the problem, though. These, these decisions are hard, they're gray, they're not clear cut. So unless you make one person able to make a decision and impose it, then you usually get dissonance. That doesn't guarantee you, by the way, that you would make the right decision all the time. But without that structure, you often just don't look at how tools come together. Thank you. Uh, well, one second. Uh, General Gray, would you like to ask a question? Or to make a comment you want me to get because up we're trying to develop you want me to get up and answer questions. Yeah. <laughs>
the economic thought process, the cultural side, all of the elements of national power and, and influence, they all play in this kind of a situation. And so there has to be a, an understanding, there has to be a cooperation, and as uh, both ambassadors have indicated, sometimes we don't do this very well. We don't do this very well. And, uh, and we pay a, a, an enormous price for it. So with that, uh, let's throw it open to questions here. All right, uh, Ambassador May, yeah. you have a question? I want to turn this on for the chair. Okay, thank you, John. No, it's not. Uh, uh, they have it. Okay. Okay. Might be give you the mic just in case. Uh, I just wanted to add to, to, to what was said. One of, from a historical standpoint, uh, one of the complicating factors in this, in, in, in all of our overseas operations, not just the counterterrorism activities, is that in the U.S., we do not have, other than the Constitution naming the president as commander-in-chief and the fact that the ambassador represents the president, we have no legal basis for determining who's in charge of who of our, our people overseas. In fact, prior to the end of World War II, there had been nothing formally said as to who was in charge of what. It was always, you send troops abroad, they were under their commander, uh, the ambassador was in charge of ambassador stuff. We realized after World War II, especially with the number of areas that were under military governments and, and had military people in effect acting as pro-consuls, uh, that, that, that something had to be done. And, and that's what started what we call the President's Letter, which is a letter given to ambassadors who are appointed, which gives them authority over not just U.S. civilian, but over all U.S. government programs except those under the direct command of a military uh, geographic commander. The problem is there's no law that, that clarifies that. There's just this letter signed by each president, and so far I'm assuming the current president has done one. Every, every president since Eisenhower has done a letter to all of his ambassadors saying, I hereby place you in charge of all U.S. government personnel and operations in country X, blah, 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 blah. And that's it. That is the only piece of official paper that exists that says someone is in charge of something. And even that is, if you'll excuse my being a little blunt, is wishy-washy because it says you're in charge of all except. And then it doesn't clarify, okay, what do you mean under a geographic military commander? Under what circumstances? Uh, and, and, it, and it is, as was said, it's left to the personalities of the people in the field to work it out. Because trust me, when they can't work it out, by the time it gets worked out back here, the situation that caused the crisis is usually over. Uh, th these kinds of decisions don't get made fast. So, so it's, it's, it is something that needs to be addressed. I'm not saying that we need to have a, a legislative solution. I'm not a fan of trying to legislate away problems. You, usually what you wind up doing is legislating into existence more problems than you, you had in the first place. But there does need to be a sustained, high-level discussion over how we coordinate all of our agencies abroad. Uh, and it's not just the, the military and, 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 and the State Department. Um, when I was ambassador to Cambodia, I found out that I had two people from the U.S. Forest Service running around the <laughs> countryside. The U.S. Forest Service in Cambodia? Uh, you have you have people from the Library of Congress running all over, gathering papers and buying books. We have we have. I wouldn't even be surprised to find someone from the Park Service in some country. The fact what I'm saying is that we have a lot of interests abroad, a lot of a very complex government, and we've not done anything to try and pull all of these together into a coordinated, coherent whole. And, and I don't think there's anywhere that's more important than trying to deal 
with extremism and terrorism because that is something that touches on economics, it touches on culture, and you can't, it's not a single agency solution, but we seem to be very reluctant to come up with a multi-agency answer to it. And I might just, um, uh, if it works. <laughs> you know, hello? Uh, you know, this isn't just overseas. <laughs> After the war, there's something called the Hoover Commission, which looked at this problem with respect to the government in Washington. And I remember, I think Justice Frankfurter wrote a letter to Hoover saying, we're suffering from scatteration. That was his word, scatteration. And he pointed out, you take any area of policy here in the US, and you could find five, 10 domestic agencies which thought they were in charge or had responsibilities. Now, it's interesting that um, Ambassador Ray mentions the Congress. I'm a law professor, and, and I, I agree with what you said. I think legislative solutions are not going to be very good, except maybe at the broadest level, because you know you're going to get into detail, and et cetera, and so forth. But it is something in America. You know, we're very individualist, we're energetic, and unfortunately, this reflects itself in the way our governments function. I mean, in many ways, I, I'm a civilian, but my impression is the military within its own sphere is probably the best at this, because then you do have a traditions of command structure, orders are followed. But in the civilian society, and in the relations between the civilian and the military, that is not the American way under any president. Anyway. Comments, questions, thoughts? Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of uh, You have a mic, please? Uh, oh, good, great, we have another one, okay. okay. Yeah, good. Well, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, one for each of the uh, for Ron, uh, Ambassador Ron Newman, uh, I think in Iraq, you were ambassador in Iraq, if I understand. I was one of the extra ambassadors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Who are you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charles Dahan. I, I work, I'm the vice president of the World Federation of Moroccan Jews. Um, I, uh, the one question I had was, uh, the main problem, I think, from the U.S. in, in Iraq or, or Afghanistan has been the misunderstanding of the local culture um, uh, by the diplomats and by the military. Uh, and basically, uh, Iraq is becoming, uh, was given away to half of the population, the Shiites, because of the control. and. Uh, and we left the sunny hanging, and basically it created that extra terrorism. Uh, Ambassador Ray, on the Iran revolution in 1979, the embassy was basically taken over very quickly without any reaction uh, from the local Marines that were supposed to defend the embassy. And what do you think of uh, how they acted? You want to take, because mine's quick. Well, mine's pretty quick. Go, go. You want the mic? Oh, uh, yes, please. Okay. When you two get done, give it back to me. I've got something to show. <laughs> Can you hear me? You have to push the green button, push it up. Green, green. It's oh. green. And then you it's at green. the very tip. You have to talk at the tip of the mic. Okay, I'm talking into the tip of the mic. Can you hear me? <laughs> and you're in the back? Okay. Bizarre. All right, first of all, a, a to clarify something, the Marines at an embassy are not there to defend the embassy. They are assigned that Marine Security Guard detachment's duties are to protect classified information and equipment within that structure. They are neither equipped nor trained nor armed to defend the physical building. I mean, at, at most, we might have 20, a very large embassy might have, I think, about 20 Marines. Uh, if a large enough force decides to take that embassy, those 20 Marines are toast. Their job is to, to, to destroy or protect the equipment and to help the, the regional security officer get uh, the people out to safety. What the, I know some of the, in fact, one of my secretaries my secretary, when I was ambassador uh, to Cambodia, was one of the hostages uh, during the crisis, and I know the 
uh, individual who was the DCM during that crisis. He's a friend of mine. Everyone involved in that did admirably under the circumstances. I mean, things things happened, and assumptions were made. First of all, in the first instance, instance, security of our embassies is the responsibility of the host government. That that is something that is part of the Vienna Conventions. When you accept an embassy on your territory, you you take on the obligation to protect and defend that embassy and its personnel. The assumption was made when the students were demonstrating that the Iranian government would keep them under control. So things were done to, to protect documents and to keep people out of harm's way. Uh, and by the time they realized that the government was not going to control the demonstrators, it was too late. Did that answer your question? Let's see. Is this thing working? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You have to feel you're almost being assaulted by the microphone before you're talking into it closely enough here. Um, I basically agree with you. I think we did not have a good understanding of culture in either country. Having said that, a couple of big differences. We went into Afghanistan because we were attacked. We were what? We went into Afghanistan because we were attacked. We didn't pick that one, nor did we have any real potential for understanding the culture before we went in. And in fact, the things that most people, including many academics, thought they understood were wrong. The biggest one of which was that everybody who knew anything about Afghanistan was advising that we have a law, a, a very light presence because we would produce a xenophobic reaction. In fact, we did not produce a xenophobic reaction. We were very broadly welcomed. Where we failed was to have an adequate reporting presence on the ground in those early days to capture that we were wrong, report it, have it affect policy, which it didn't do, which is your basic point. Um, Iraq, the list of political errors is extraordinarily long. Um, and the predominance of tending toward the Shia, I saw that, and the uh, it, that was there. Uh, Shia plus Kurds, and we uh, ignored the Sunni. We didn't ignore the Sunnis, though. Efforts to deal with the Sunnis were extraordinarily difficult. Now, we made a lot of mistakes that made it worse, including the abandonment of the army, and the fact there was no pension, a lot of other stuff. But there were also problems within the Sunni community. It had no leadership equivalent to the Shias. Shias were basically organized in several very strong parties. Well, they weren't that strong, but they got stronger. Dawa, the uh, Islamic movement in Iraq. The Sunnis had no comparable organization, and they were constantly fighting with each other. So that when we went in, for instance, to the elections in January 2005, you could deal with a small number of major Shia leaders and get agreement about get them to agree to participate in the election. You also had Ayatollah Sistani, who had a great deal of influence helping that. With the Sunnis, not only did you have no, not a few leaders, you had bunches of leaders, but they were all suspicious of each other. They were constantly worrying that if one agreed to do something, he would be denounced by his fellows for being too soft. So there was a lack, I, I totally agree, and we we magnify that lack by the speed with which we rotate personnel, which is, I think, our, one of our greatest weaknesses. If I had one single takeaway from Afghanistan and Iraq, it would be that we have to leave senior personnel for much longer periods of time on the ground so that you can grow a learning organization. Our rapid rotation of personnel is absolutely antithetical to growing a learning organization. But that's only more detail on top of a fundamentally correct point of view. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, length of time and continuity is so important. Uh, in my own personal experience, for example, uh, I spent parts of eight years in Vietnam. And that gave me a tremendous advantage on whether you're talking culture, whether you're talking political thoughts, whether you're talking ambassadorial type concerns, whether you're talking about tactics, strategy, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, terrorism, 
We had a lot of terrorism in Vietnam, as many of you know. In, in 1965, for example, 1,000 uh, South Vietnamese village chiefs who were pro-South Vietnam, who were pro-Republic uh, or Democratic type thought process were assassinated by Viet Cong. And if you were with me uh, in October of 1965, south of Da Nang, uh, you would have seen a small 11-year-old Vietnamese girl come up to our Marines crying. Uh, her father was a, was a district chief uh, pro-South Vietnam government, and he'd been uh, assassinated by the Viet Cong the night before, and this little Vietnamese girl had her arms cut off and her elbows. That's terrorism of the first degree. You never heard about that. You never read about that. You never heard about it on TV. So this kind of thing has been going on, as our, our speakers have said, for a long, long time. With respect to uh, Iran, and the, and the embassies, it's the, it's the government, the foreign government is responsible for the security of the embassy. Uh, strange as that may seem with Iran and all that, but that's the way it, it's, uh, it's done. And so uh, uh, when these things happen, like in 1979, when the Iranian embassy uh, uh, was, uh, was attacked and like, these people were captured, uh, we had to take steps to try to get them back. We didn't know where they were. We spent uh, the rest of November, December, January, February, and March, till the middle of March, before we figured out where they were. Most of them were in the cafeteria complex, and then a couple others were in another location. We actually found that out when some of the Marine Guards uh, blinked uh, with their eyes the Morse code and gave the code word for the, uh, for the cafeteria. <coughs> that's how we found out where they were. And that's how JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command Officer, then uh, began to plan the operation. The operation itself was, uh, was uh, planned in many, many people's opinion very poorly and that type of thing. And, and there were a lot of things that happened. But again, uh, it was only the United States really had the capability to even try to do it. And we tried to do it, we failed, but uh, at least we tried. And, uh, and we learned a lot from that. We, uh, we're much better at that kind of thing today, I can assure you. Uh, so that, uh, these are the kind of things that happen. And with, the, uh, with respect to the embassies and the like, it's, uh, it's, it's behooving to everybody, whether they're military, civilian ambassadors, or aid, or any other kind of uh, profession, you need to learn about the other organizations that you're supposed to work with. It's called teamwork. It's called working together. <laughs> And whether there's a chain of command or not, you got to work together. There is one person in charge, and he's called the president. He's in charge of all the ambassadors, and he's in charge of all the military as the commander in chief. And uh, it's the job, in my judgment, of the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor to coordinate and handle a lot of these things. They don't do their job very well, in my opinion. Uh, they get the uh, They've grown, and you know, we've had them for five decades. It was founded in 1947, and uh, and we've had them for a long time. The National Security Advisor, National Security Council. They started out with about 40 people, and they were pretty good because, as Ambassador Scowcroft and others have said, if you have 40 or 50 people, you get to know them and understand them, and it really works well. Now they have over 400 in that last year. And we just did a big study to try to make it smaller and so I'm more effective. Most people think it should be no more than about 100 or so. And, and their job really is to, is to take the advice of the various cabinet officials and other leaders, whether it's defense, whether it's commerce, whether it's energy, whatever, but their ideas, and then you take their ideas and you coordinate them and you present them and you, you present uh, different views for you know, pro and con not to take it over. And yet what we have done over time is created a National Security Council and on many occasions takes over the project and runs it on a day-to-day -day basis. And this destroys really the whole ability of, of ambassadors and, and, and other government officials to get done what has to be done. So the National Security Council needs to get, to, needs to be smaller, needs to get back in the business of coordinating activities, and then uh, they want to have a strategic planning group, too, because everything we do must, must come back to our strategy. And then when we do a bunch of things, uh, whether we're an ambassador or anybody else like that, when we do things that are not consistent with the national strategy and where we want to be and what we want to look like, we're going to have problems. And we have these kind of problems. So we need to do a much better job, I think, of coordinating this. Uh, 
Any other questions, comments? Uh, General, let me make two small points. Uh, trivial. One on this question of defending embassies. When you drive around Washington, you can see very often a police car in front of an embassy, excuse me, from the President's Protective Service, and that's what they're there for, to sound the alarm if someone attacks an embassy. Uh, and then the point that the ambas Ambassador Newman referred to, I, in 19, early 60s, I went out to Sudan for the U.S. government, and I encountered, first of all, spectacular people in the Sudanese government then, uh, Americans at the embassy, excellent, for two years, three years, they were gone. On the other hand, I met some Brit, he'd been there for 30 years, embedded in some, he was a doctor, actually, and he wasn't the only one out there. And of course, in a way, of course, the, the British had governed the Sudan along with the Egyptians, but it's a totally different thing. And I live in the Middle East, and I've seen it again and again and again. Very gifted Americans are there for a short time. Occasionally, you find the odd intelligence agent not so identified who's out there for a longer time. But it's very rare. And how the hell? And then, of course, you have the media and you have American politics. Very hard to deal with this government because it's changing from, you know, administration to administration. So we really have shot ourselves in more than the foot, in my view. <laughs> yeah, there's, you had a question. There's one other function that we haven't talked about, uh, and he's uh, also a member of this National Security Council. And that's the head of of intelligence, the director of national intelligence, and like he plays a role. In, intelligence plays a role in all these uh, activities you've been talking about as well. And sometimes that works very well, and sometimes it doesn't. You get questions. Oh, one, one more question and over we, there. We got, we got one there and one here. Yeah, please identify yourself. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, my name is Naomi Ronaldo. I'm an intern over at the Institute for Policy Studies, and I wanted to thank you all for your time on this panel. It's been an incredible experience. Um, so earlier in this conversation, you kind of stated that uh, military action isn't necessarily a resolution for, for terrorism. Um, it's more so the ideology in those areas that stick. Um, and I'm curious to what your opinions are and the role that our federal, federal government should play in combating that ideology. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, we're going to run out of time here, so. I think we have to be a little humble. I think we have to recognize that in many cases, our ability to combat ideology is extremely limited. And we should do what we can. You know, we should speak for ourselves and we should speak clearly. But you know, with with some of the biggest issues we have right now, with Al Qaeda, with the Islamic State, these are issues within the Muslim world. They're issues among the Ummah. We are we're not going to be able to, we, we can address them, and we should. We can probably do a little better than we have done, although we're, we've gotten a bit better in responding to particular issues. But ultimately, they're going to have to be solved within the culture itself. And, and there is a great deal of struggle within the culture. It's not like other people are passive. Um, I think we have, to, you know, we have to do what we can, but we have to also recognize the limits of our ability to to do things, we're not very good at that. We're we're very you know we're very good at deciding to do something, or we're very good at waiting and doing nothing while we think about it. We're not very good at deciding not to do something. Uh, and sometimes we need to decide on the limits. Uh, General, may I ask uh, may I ask uh, our speakers uh, last question uh, because of the time? I think uh, element. Um, what would you advise to the young people here in terms of um, perhaps thinking about a professional um, career in diplomacy uh, in, in light of the confusing uh, messages that um, we are getting on the internet um, and in terms of what's the role of diplomacy, is it uh, critical to national security? And uh, again, as an academic working with the young people every single day, they uh, have questions about this. Uh, what kind of profession should they pursue? So what would be your advice to them? 
Damn, I'll go if you want to. Okay, one, follow your gut. Wait, do something you're going to be happy with because it's a long life. Uh, second, yes, I totally endorse going into the Foreign Service if that's what you are called to. We are having some problems right now. We've got an administration that, frankly, is great. They're very suspicious of career professionals, whether they're civil servants or foreign service. But one, the nation needs a high-quality diplomacy. And you, there's no time at which you're not going to have diplomacy. You can have bad diplomacy. You always have it. Uh, secondly, the situation when you go in and the situation when you get to a post and the situation when you get to another post are all going to be different. So don't get all wrapped around the axle with where we are today. <laughs> if the Foreign Service, if diplomacy is a, something that calls to you, by all means, go do it. And I would point out something. While, while the situation in regards to the Foreign Service uh, and the Civil Service is probably starker uh, currently than it has been in, in the 50 years that I served in government, if you look back in the history of this country, diplomats have never been trusted, <laughs> uh, have never been highly valued, and have never been understood. So it's a matter. Of, <laughs> Can I add a? <laughs> it's a matter of degree. But but the fact is that even though we, as a, as a colleague of mine on the West Coast once said, historically for two hundred plus years the U.S. has practiced anti diplomacy. Uh, we, in fact, do need diplomats, even when we are reluctant to acknowledge that fact. We need people who are willing to, and, and who, if you have, as, as, as Ron said, if you feel the calling, uh, then, then it is probably the profession to take. If you need to be constantly told how great you are and how much we love you, then go into another business, because in this business it ain't going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have. Uh, yeah, Let, I have Anybody else? Yeah. No, finish up. No, but I, of course, I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, I don't want you to leave your very thinking it's all bad. We're still the greatest uh, nation in the world, and we're still going to be the greatest nation in the world, and we're still going to be uh, one of the world's leaders for a long time to come, certainly in all of your uh, lifetimes. And so I would encourage you, if you so are disposed to, uh, to enter government service, do it. And do it with the idea that, uh, that you and your colleagues uh, can make a difference, because you can. Uh, if you're an ambassador and all, of course, you represent the United States of America in a certain country, but also you're there uh, really to help that country grow, to help that country make it, to help the people uh, be stronger, morally, mentally, physically, economically, et cetera. And so it's all a good kind of a thing. And you can't help people without knowing them. You can't hate, help a country without understanding the mores, the cultures, the languages, and what they're all about. So if you want a, if you want a career uh, wherein you get to do some good things, then go ahead and do it. Go into diplomacy and lawyer. I happen to be one of the few military people that likes to diplomats. I think, uh, <laughs> I think they've done a great uh, service everywhere I've ever been. I've had my share of challenges with them over time for different reasons, but always these people had the United States at the, at the bottom of their heart, and they had the country that they were serving in uh, uh, that, that was uppermost in their minds. And so it's really a, a great profession, and I wouldn't uh, go out of here except feeling any way but upbeat. Thank you. Shout your question, Milton. I have a question. It's a Shout. historical question. Shout it. Shout it? Yeah. Well, no, it's a question for your uh, ambassador, Newman. Um, you mentioned the uh, Act in Sarajevo was precipitated into the merging into the First World War. I recall he uh, traveling to Rome to get, and it sticks in my mind to the black cemetery there, around Kiev, which the result of the First World War. So I'm wondering uh, what did we actually learn a lesson from the way the word First World War grew and uh, the, the, the event? I don't know that we learned 
a great deal. I, I don't know that one can necessarily avoid. I mean, you can avoid that situation by better personal security and a little bit of luck. I'm not sure. Otherwise, you can then you can deal with the question of how you respond to different issues. The whole bit. I mean, there's an interesting uh, book. I'm trying to remember the name of uh, a new book on Kaiser Wilhelm that suggests uh, incredible incapacity of that one leader, and you had, you had a lot of things. If you had to learn anything from World War I right now, I would say look at the fact that no one believed you could have a war. It was generally believed that you could not have a major war, and even on the eve of the war, preponderant belief was that if you had a war, it was going to be a very short one. Um, so that as we look at our current world, I'm not predicting a war, but we have gotten into the mode of feeling that this is now not possible. We could just have various challenges. Uh, we should Milton, occasionally very, worry about that. There's a very good book called The Sleepwalkers by Chris yeah, that's it. Yeah. And that's worth looking at. It's more as good Ambassador Newman said. And then also the chauffeur turned in the wrong direction. You know, he, he was supposed to get on one road and he went the other and, and Princip was waiting at one corner, not in the other. The book, but of course this is, I mean, that's a kind of question which annoys people because there is no yeah. easy So what is the book. lesson from that? Use your Google Maps. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Yeah.